You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 20, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atopic dermatitis. Our presenter is Dr. Luz Finasier. She's currently the president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She's also a professor of medicine and head of the section of allergy immunology at the New York University Long Island School of Medicine in Mineola, New York. Uh, uh, Our topic today is atopic dermatitis, and I did put a few changes here. So next slide, please. Okay, so these are my disclosures. We have research grants to the hospital and advisory boards. Next slide. So we want to identify patients with atopic dermatitis. The first thing is since we're talking to fellows and uh, uh, we want to learn how to identify patients with atopic dermatitis. The first thing is you do want to confirm the diagnosis. And the second is you want to determine the severity of your diagnosis and actually document it. As Gary said earlier, documentation is very important uh, in how we build these patients. Then I'd like to discuss current standard of care and then new and emerging treatment for atopic dermatitis. Next slide. So uh, this is the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis. I'm bringing it up as the first uh, slide because I want to um, uh, let you know that all our treatment options are targeted to these defects uh, in atopic dermatitis. And the first is a barrier defect. We know about the filaggrin mutation, and we know that when there's an itch scratch cycle, if the patient scratches a lot, uh, there is a uh, th- that produces a big barrier defect. With the barrier defect, you have irritants, allergens, and infections which interface with the Langerhans cells and the dendritic cells. Next. This then will activate the immune system, particularly of the Th2 and the Th22 signaling pathways. Next. And this Th2 Two cytokines, such as IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5, uh, will lead to IgE class switching and induce peripheral eosinophils and mast cells. Slide. And Th2 and Th2 cytokines also contribute to the impaired expression of the barrier proteins and the barrier impairment. Next slide. So very important is that you first confirm your diagnosis. And so we discuss differential diagnosis. Next. So there are important, essential, important, and associated features defining atopic dermatitis. Very essential, must be present at all time, is pruritus or itching, eczema, that can be acute, subacute, or chronic. Morphology is uh, important, age-specific in infants and children. It will be the face, the neck, and the extensor area. And any other groups, it would have the flexural lesions and usually sparing the groin and the axilla. It's also chronic or relapsing. And important and supporting our diagnosis is the early age of onset, then the presence of atopy. And atopy can be described as the personal and or family history of atopy, asthma, allergic rhinitis, or atopic dermatitis, or an elevated total and specific IgE, and dryness or cirrhosis. Associated criteria, which are nonspecific, which will support your diagnosis, includes the lichenification, lichen simplex chronicus, and parigo. I'll show you pictures of that later. Next. So this is the distribution patterns which vary with age. And in infants, you can see it's the forehead, the cheeks, and the chin. Uh, you can have it in the trunk as well. Uh, young children would have face, neck, antecubital, and posterior popliteal areas. And in adults, you can, and adolescents, you will have like the, the uh, neck area, the hands, and the flexural areas as well. Next. This is, uh, I I just added this this year because I think what we need to understand that there are clinical features in darker skin types. And when we have to learn about diversity, especially in atopic dermatitis, we don't see this in textbooks. 
And I think it's very important that we keep this in mind when we see skin of different colors. So you, on the left, you will see the white skin and the prominent erythema that you can see in these patients. Look at this knee and look at this anterior chest. On the right, you can see the darker skin. It does not have the redness that you see in white skin. What you see is more purplish, violaceous, or even brownish. Next slide. Hypopigmentation may also present differently. In the white skin, it's not as prominent. As you go down in a brown skin, like for example, a Philippine or a Malaysian skin, you will see that the pigmentation looks different. But look at the black skin, where this is where the quality of life is very much affected in the black skin, especially if this now occurs on very uh, prominent areas, for example, the face or the arms. Next. Follicular accentuation, you can see more in darker skin, as you can see here in the neck and in the buttocks. And then this what we call ashy skin or grayish white, white skin that you can see more commonly in dark, dark pigmented skin types. Next. Profound cirrhosis or lichenification, you can see this dryness in this baby who's already scratching himself. And there's a high rate of lesions on the trunk in dark skin. This actually is a challenge assessing the body surface area of the patient. Because like in the shoulders, you might consider it not affected, but it's actually affected if you look at it closely. Next. Prorigo nodularis, as I described earlier, which is an associated feature, uh, is more, more common and more prominent in the darker skin patients. Next. So difficult to monitor topical corticosteroid side effects in darker skin as well. Uh, next. You have the stria, you have the atrophy here. Next. And you have the telinjectasia, and you can see how it would be difficult to detect these changes. Next. You want to exclude, what is your differential diagnosis for atopic dermatitis? Scabies? Next. You can see here the extensive scabies that will mimic atopic dermatitis. Next. Seborrheic dermatitis, which is common in the forehead, in the nasolabial fold. Next. Contact dermatitis. This is actually a, a, a child who has extensive atopic dermatitis, and mom is very vigilant about the wet traps, and this is now an irritant contact dermatitis due to wet traps, and you can see how well demarcated the boundaries are. Next. Ichthyosis or dryness, which looks like fish scales. Next. You have cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Not as itchy, but still looking eczematous and atopic dermatitis. Next. Next. And of course, you have your erythema of other causes and your polycyclic erythema and scaling, which I will discuss in the next slide as part of immune deficiency diseases. Next. So we have a six-year-old girl, very pyritic eczematous dermatitis on the face, perioral area, arms and back. They have diarrhea, fairly thrive for up to one year old. Uh, has a history of peanut allergy, and both parents have atopic dermatitis. Next. So you did, uh, if you notice the girl's hair was a little sparse, and you did take uh, a piece of that hair, and here you see on the right side is the bamboo appearance of that hair. And mom says that this kid had, migratory, had this type of... Uh, polycyclic red scaly lesions in the back as a baby. Next. So this is a rare autosomal recessive genodermatosis called Netherton syndrome, where you have your erythroderma or redness of the skin. You have the bamboo hair or trichohexis invaginata. You have ichthyosis linearis circumflexa. You have atopic diathesis and failure to thrive. Next. 
These patients have immunologic abnormalities such as transient neutrophil function defects, impaired cellular and immune responses, and raised complement levels, C3 and C4. Next. We move on now to an adult, 61-year-old female, five-year duration of operatic eczema. This patient has no family history of atopy and has since discontinued her only medication for hypertension, had a trial of topical corticosteroids, which did not help. Next. So this is a type of skin that you want to look at a bit more closely. You will see the patch here. This has been going on for many years. This patch that you can see on the right side is thin, wrinkly. Often you can have reticulated pigmentation. These patients have minimal or absent spiritus, which is common in the premycotic phase of mycosis fungoides. Note that mycosis fungoides may precede uh, the, the cutaneous lesions may precede mycosis fungoides by years, so your, your minimal itching may be there, and yet you don't have the actual rash yet. There's also more often in the lower trunk and buttocks. Then you can also see other stages, next, which is the plaque stage, next, and the tumor stage. This, the, uh, this disease has to be diagnosed by skin biopsy, and you may have to take multiple skin biopsies. And there is noted a delay of about six months before a final diagnosis is made because uh, it doesn't become so apparent until the disease has progressed. Next slide. These are the tools we use in clinical trials and uh, to disease to assess disease severity. Just wanted to put out a few points here: the SCORAD, the EASY, and the IGA. The SCORAD is physician assessed. It talks about the extent of the lesions that are measured, and this is rule of nine, and includes patient assess symptoms. The easy score is physician to assess. It does not include the patient's symptoms. And the extent of lesion is also calculated. The IGA is the easiest to use. It is a physician assess, but obviously extent of lesion and the patient assess symptoms are not uh, included in the IGA. Next. So what is the criteria to determine the severity of atopic dermatitis? One is the extent of the disease, more than 10% of the body surface area. The second is severity of lesion, which is excoriation, lichenification, and infections. Next. The third is areas involved, highly visible or important for function as the neck, neck genital spumps and soles. And even if you don't have more than 10% of body area, if you have areas involved that are highly visible or functional, that increases the severity category of atopic dermatitis. Symptom burden and quality of life, paritis, sleep, emotional and mental disturbances, and interference with daily activities. Next. This is how you measure the extent of the disease. So uh, the easiest way is the rule of nines, where we, which is what we use in burn units. And note that about the palmar surface uh, that you have is about half a percent of body first surface area. And the whole hand, including the fingers, equates to about 1% of body surface area. This is a good rule of thumb to use when you're assessing the extent of the disease. Next. IgA, as I said, is the uh, easiest way, really. You have clear, almost clear, mild, moderate, or disease. It uh, has not been validated in practice setting, and it's static. It's when you see the patient. So uh, it's given at a different time point. It does not evaluate itching. It doesn't evaluate body surface area. But next, the FDA has actually accepted this in clinical trials and, pretty, and it's pretty simple. Next. So how do you assess pruritus? As I said, the IgA alone does not assess pruritus. It's pretty... Um, Easy to assess this in 10 seconds, pruritus numerical rating scale, where you ask them from 1 to 10, 
zero, no itch, 10, worst imaginable, 8 wakes you up from sleep, 6 distracts you from activity, where is your itch core? And you are come up the past 24 hours and you come up with a number. Next. So, is there a the practical objective tool for assessing or identifying moderate to severe atopic dermatitis? Well, the simplest really that you can do in the office is percent body surface area, your IgA score, and your quality of life. So moderate to severe atopic dermatitis may be considered when one or more of the following features are present. Moderate is 5 to 10% of body surface area and an IgA of, of 3. And severe if it's more than 10% and an IgA of 4. Next. Regardless, as I said, of BSA, individual lesions with moderate to severe features or involvement of the highly visible areas of the face, the, ne the neck, the palms, and the soles, and significant impairment of quality of life increases severity category. Next. So this is the latest uh, so far that the college has uh, published on the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Next. Very first is looking at the basic management such as skin care, moisturization, baths, and avoidance of trigger. Next. So how do you identify triggers? Well, the common triggers we know are infections such as bacterial superinfection, eczema herpeticum, dermatophytic infections, malazesia. You see here in the a boy on the uh, on the lowest uh, box and IgE to IgE antibodies against malassezia has been reported in these cases and if treated improves the atopic dermatitis. Contact dermatitis, uh, irritant and allergic could trigger food and of course area allergens such as dust mites, pets and pollen. Next. The principles of therapy is general supportive care, get that disease under control and keep it under control. Next. So general supportive therapy, skin hydration and barrier therapy, emollients, baths, and wet wraps, avoid irritants and specific allergens. Next, get that disease under control with anti-inflammatory medications. The strength will be based on disease severity, the stronger steroids for short burst. And next, keep it under control by using steroid uh, sparing agents such as immunomodulators, uh, immuno devices uh, and proactive treatment. Next. Basic skin care, what I tell my patients is soak for 10 to 20 minutes, may or may not need oatmeal or baking soda, it has the same effect. Quickly clean with mild soaps and cleansers, we can have Banyderm, Dove, Vasics or Neutrogena, pat dry, then apply your emollient, uh, occlusive emollient or topical medication immediately. This will improve your skin barrier function, will reduce susceptibility to irritant, and it actually strengthens the skin by delaying intracellular filaggrin uncoiling. Next. Topical corticosteroids, it's now approved, are the topical corticosteroid, uh, topical medications include topical corticosteroids, which is the first line of treatment. We all know uh, that it can cause side effects including skin atrophy and thinning if used inappropriately. Calcinerum inhibitors such as the Crolimus and Pyrimicrolimus is non-steroidal, is now um, available as generic. There is no risk for skin atrophy but there is still this black box warning despite with very little evidence of it. And the Crisaborol or PDE4 inhibitor which is also non-steroidal which was approved in 2016. It inhibits cyclic AMP novel. Next. So I wanted to sh show you what you need to monitor with topical corticosteroids. If you can just go through these slides quickly. So you have here your stria atrophy. Uh, next, uh, th that's your telangiectasia. That's your hypopigmentation. Next. But you have systemic side effects as well, and so you need to monitor for adrenal suppression, especially in infants and small children. Uh, 
Note that uh, adherence is important with topical corticosteroids. There are patients who are under, under treated because they fear steroid side effects. And there are patients who are over treated because of lack of education. So addressing the patient fears or the mom's fears of steroid side effect will improve adherence. Next. Topical corticosteroid inhibitor is especially useful in the eyelid, perioral, genital, axillary, and inguinal area. Its anti-inflammatory potency is about 0.1%. Uh, tacrolimus is about an intermediate strength corticosteroid, which is more potent than the 1% bimicrolimus. Next. It's been shown to be safe for proactive treatment. Next. Crisaborol, as we talked about earlier, is a PDE4 inhibitor. Uh, it seemed to work a little bit better on the pruritus because uh, it directly regulates pruritus through reduction of uh, cutaneous neuron and dorsal root gangrene neuron activity and a pretty favorable safety profile. Next. Now, if your patients fail or have intermittent acute uh, episodes, there is the acute crisis intervention that we give patients, especially if you see them the first time, is a 10 to 20 minute bleach bath once daily for three to four days. Uh, twice daily topical therapy, your topical anti-inflammatory agent, at least a mid-potency, uh, and an emollient on top of it. Next. Wet wraps can be done. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult, but again, if you do wet wraps two to three times a week for one week, it usually is sufficient to get the, uh, the uh, child's um, atopic dermatitis under control. Next. When all the pieces of the puzzle are in place, your diagnosis is correct, you have ruled out infection, contact dermatitis, you have controlled the secondary skin infection, you've investigated food and allergens, you educated the mom and the compliance is reinforced, and you have psychosocial issues sorted out, then you have to move on to the next level. Next. Next. So there are, uh, when do you define a treatment failure? There's really no standard definition, but in the expert panel in 2017 had these four categories, which can be considered as failure of treatment. Inadequate clinical improvement, lack of stable long-term control, uh, no relief from impairment, you continue to have paritis, pain, loss of sleep, poor quality of life, or you start to have the adverse effects leading to treatment discontinuation. Next. Time frame, we, there's also no standardized, generalized time frame to prove efficacy, but given the potency and dosage forms of the topical corticosteroids, it's probably reasonable to say up to four weeks of active treatment and two to three times weekly for preventative treatment. Obviously, there will be selected patients and specific body sites where treatment has to be tried more than four weeks. Next. Newer therapies are out, and we know that there are biologics and small molecules, and I just want to go over the definition of each one. So biologic agents are produced from living organisms. They are larger in size and they are typically parenteral or ejected. The mechanisms by which biologics interfere with pathologic pathways include soluble receptors, antibodies against cytokines themselves or against the cytokine receptors. Small molecules, on the other hand, are compounds manufactured through chemical synthesis. Most of our drugs, oral drugs now, are actually small molecules. They're smaller in size and may be given orally. Next. So the first biologic we're going to talk about is your dopilumab, anti-IL-4, anti-IL-13. Uh, as you can see, targeting the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis. Next. What does IL-4 and IL-13 do? IL-4 and IL-13 actually amplifies the signaling of type 2 cytokines. 
It increases the recruitment of inflammatory cells, it increases sensitivity to allergens, and it causes an inappropriate IgE class switching. This results in a weakened epidermal barrier function, decreased antimicrobial proteins, decreased keratinocyte differentiation, and decreased epidermal lipids. Next. So, next. So this is what the Pilimab does. It's a fully human antibody against IL-4 receptor alpha. The adverse reactions reported from the, the Pilimab administration, uh, which is more than 1% of subjects, is injection site reaction and conjunctivitis. Next. There are some available systemic therapies but they are limited by risk and benefits. And we know that systemic corticosteroids, although work very well, uh, have a rebound phenomenon may occur and the skin lesions may get worse after discontinuation of the oral systemic corticosteroids. It's reserved for crisis management. You have to have a strategy for long-term use, taper the dose and intensify skin care. We really hardly use um, oral corticosteroids now for uh, treatment of atopic dermatitis because of this rebound. Next. So phototherapy we know works, but again, it will need three visits in a dermatology office uh, and insurance may not cover it, but it is it has been shown uh, to have efficacy for chronic moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Next. There are available systemic therapies, which is our go-to after a failure of the Pilimab and all our other crisis intervention, cyclosporine, methotrexate, azathioprine, and mycophenolate. All of them have block box warning of malignancy, uh, and uh, the, the use is really limited by the risk of these side effects. Next. As we know, when we treat atopic dermatitis, uh, this has been, uh, we do reactive treatment if we see visible disease, but then we stop treatment if we don't see visible disease. Um, but we know that a patient can go back and forth. Next. Thus, proactive treatment has been shown to be effective. So areas that usually get their flares but are normal appearing, for example, your antecubital or popliteal, posterior popliteal fossa, topical corticosteroids given to successive evenings weekly. I tell my patient, apply it Saturday and Sunday actually showed 3.5 times less likely to flare compared to emollient alone, and uh, adverse, uh, adverse side effects were rarely seen. This also goes for tacrolimus. A uh, study has shown that the patients who are given twice a week of tacrolimus had significantly more flare-free treatment days compared to vehicle. Next. This is an interesting study of a randomized controlled trial of 124 neonates high risk for atopic dermatitis where they use full body emollient therapy at least once a day starting at three weeks of birth and it showed protective effect in the cumulative incidence of atopic dermatitis. Uh, the emollient therapy from birth represents a feasible, safe, and effective approach for atopic dermatitis prevention. Next. We move now to emerging targeted systemic therapies, and we talked about the IL-4 receptor alpha. Let's move on to IL-13. Next. So trilokinumab is a fully human antibody against IL-13, and it's been shown to be superior to placebo at 300 milligrams sub-Q every two weeks. It did have a higher rate of nasopharyngitis than placebo, and it, a conjunctivitis still occurred more frequently with trilokinumab than placebo. Next. We move to nimolizumab, which is an IL-31. Next. So 
mechanism of pruritus or H in atopic dermatitis, they're both histamine-dependent and histamine-independent signaling pathways that mediate pruritus. IL-4, IL-13, and IL-31 elicit their functions through the JAK-STAT signaling. Next. Uh, IL-31 has had, uh, is now in phase two trial for treatment of atopic dermatitis and pruritus. We move on to uh, the JAKs. These are now small molecules. Next. So what are JAK inhibitors? JAK-STAT, JAK signal transducer and activator of transcription, is an intracellular signaling pathway on which many pro-inflammatory cytokines elicit their pathophysiologic functions. Next. Next. There are JAK pairings in different cytokines, and the therapeutic profiler of individual JAK inhibitors depend on the multiple factors, including relative potency towards the different JAKs, the selectivity, the intracellular concentration, but note that no JAK inhibitor is specific for only one JAK isoform. Next. So there are oral JAKs, such as baricitinib, bupacitinib, and abracitinib, and there are topical JAK inhibitors. Next. There are multiple factors that combine to contribute to skin barrier dysfunction in atopic dermatitis. So we talked about the genetics, such as filaggrin mutation, environmental, look for infections, fungal, um, allergies, contact allergens, uh, immune modulation as such as activation of the Th2 and other immune cell types, and microbiome such as shifts in microbiome might explain temporal changes in the, the disease activity. Next. So the cutaneous microbiome, is it a villain or a friend? We, what we know is that atopic dermatitis flares have been associated with two things. One, increase in staph aureus, and second is reduction in microbial diversity. Next. And we know that staph aureus produce exotoxins that stimulate the immune response. They do worsen barrier epidermal, uh, epidermal barrier because of the proteases. And that we also know that dilute breach bath uh, shows some efficacy and it is thought to be due to a decrease in atopic dermata from the reduction in staph aureus and increased expression of barrier proteins. Next. However, it's both the reduction in microbial diversity and not just an increase in staph aureus, which is a focus of potential therapeutics. We know that the therapy with commensal bacteria is the basis for fecal transplant in C. difficile, and this could be the basis of hygiene hypothesis as well. Next. So I wanted to present the topical microbiome transplant, Trishimonas mucosa. It's a predominant gram-negative bacteria on the skin, and 70% of people with healthy skin are colonized by Trishimonas, whereas only 20% of patients with eczema, and this was tried on 10 adults and 5 children where they sprayed Drusimonas mucosa twice a week, uh, and skin improvement, as you can see in week 10, was noted in 65%, and no complications or infections were noted. Next. Another recently published from JAMA is the autologous bacteriotherapy to treat staph aureus in patients with atopic dermatitis. We already said atopic dermatitis is negatively affected by staph aureus. The atopic dermatitis skin is actually deficient in antimicrobial producing coagulase negative staph that can kill staph aureus. So what did they decide to do? What they did was the autologous conness was isolated from non-lesional skin of the same patient. This autologous coness was expanded by culture and then reapplied topically to the forearm uh, uh, with the control of the vehicle. And the staph aureus colonization on the lesional skin at the end of the treatment with autologous coness was reduced by 99.2% against vehicle 
This persisted for four days, but interestingly, the local EC score of the treated area on day 11 was also significantly improved. So it did not only decrease the staph aureus colonization, but it also improved the EC score. So the data suggests that bacterial therapy with an autologous strain of skin, commensal bacteria, can safely decrease staph aureus colonization and improve disease severity. Next. These em emerging new therapies have the potential to revolutionize atopic dermatitis. Next. But the extent of their effect on your patient care will depend on their affordability and obviously the accessibility of the patients with a broad range of socioeconomic groups and different insurance status. Next. So let me end with this summary of how we treat atopic dermatitis. So stepping up from mild to moderate, our options are increasing your topical corticosteroids, add the crolimus, add crisaborol, and reassess your patient every four to six weeks. Next. Stepping up from moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, if your treatment have failed, you can add the pilumab phototherapy or go on into systemic immunosuppressant therapy such as cyclosporin, methotrexate, or mycophenolate. Note that at this point, a referral to the specialist should be considered because for some patients, wet wraps or even hospitalization uh, may be needed, especially for infants, comorbidities such as food allergies need to be evaluated. Next. So thank you very much. We would like to have our patients from looking this way to next looking like this. And we can do it with, uh, with, a treat, with a proper treatment of atopic dermatitis. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. That was fantastic. Um, we have time for some questions. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, Luce, congratulations on your position with the College of Allergy. You're the president this year, aren't you? Yes, Jay, and it's almost the end of my presidency. Would you believe one year of uh, being locked down? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope you uh, enjoyed it as much as you could. Um, yes, you did tell me. It was fun. College has been in great hands. But anyway, um, atopic dermatitis is one of our most frustrating conditions. <clears throat> a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, what, what is the role of doing allergy testing and food allergies and all of that? Because I, I still pa see patients with atopic dermatitis referred in for food testing and elimination diets and all of that stuff. And I, I've not... I don't know. What, what, is your, what is your thought about that? Uh, the, there is very, really very limited role in uh, food allergy testing in atopic dermatitis, but they certainly do have role in some children who do report food sensitivity. There's no role for ordering a whole battery of food allergy testing, which usually we get as allergists sent to us by the primary care. And now we have to sort it out. So I think that is more of my problem than the allergies actually uh, uh, getting this test. It's so available by the blood test that uh, it becomes more of a problem. But uh, again, there has been uh, uh, studies that showed peanut allergy or milk or egg allergy uh, with the um, uh, improvement after they, they have discontinued this because of a positive evaluation and however I think that it is just an additional factor and it's not the sole cause of atopic dermatitis as I said there is genetics there is microbiome uh, there is environment and it's only one of them and I think we are seeing now with this biologics that really the immune regulation is probably the uh, uh, more important impacting um, defect in atopic dermatitis. Yeah, and um, I agree with you. Should be used a little Sorry, bit Jay, you're breaking up. Before, because it's such an effective treatment, the biggest problem, of course, is getting the health plans to approve it because they, they will deny it with any excuse at all. 
what I've found is that the easy score seems to be the thing that they look at most. So I've started doing that routinely on any patient that uh, I think might need to go go on a biologic. Um, yeah. Think about that. Uh, yeah, it, the easy score is still not easy. So I haven't had any problem as long as I document th three things. One, body surface area. Second, parietal score. And the third is the IgA. If you have all three, that has everything that the easy score is asking for anyway. And it's really so, you know, you can really do these things in five minutes. Great. Thank, thank you, Liz. And again, congratulations on your presidency. Thank you, Jay. Hopefully we we'll see each other in New Orleans. Okay. Do we have any more questions for today? This might seem like a fairly simple question, but um, I was told at a conference once that if you use bleach baths in a patient, when they get out, you might spray them with a dilute acetic acid solution to lower the pH because bleach has such a high pH. Have you ever heard that? No. If you put your, if you don't have a very concentrated bleach bath, that's why you just want to put a quarter of a of a cup in a in a in in water in in your bathtub. Then you really don't need to spray. Remember, you are going to wash it off anyway. You're just taking off colonization. From a bleach bath, you have to wash the patient off and then apply your moisturizer right on top of it. I think that's something parents sometimes overlook. Yeah. Yeah, the washing off is what a lot of parents overlook, but you need to rinse them out. We're excited about the JAK inhibitors. Uh, there's some delay in the FDA, but I think if, the, if it does come... Uh, we will have another option beyond um, the Piloma at this time. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up for today. Thanks for participating on uh, conference online and allergy. And uh, like Jay said, we we or we all hope to see each other soon at the American College meeting. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>